a fellow in Poland wrote me a message that he said, um, he said, I just ordered your book and it just arrived, but I'm not going to have a chance to read it because I have a 15-year-old Ukrainian refugee who just came and is living in my house. Oh. And, he, and he wants nothing more than to retaliate against Russia. So I gave him your book. <laughs> <laughs> if my identity were known, it would put myself and my family at risk. Hey everyone, it's David Bombal back with a very special guest. He's the author of this book and other books. And I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, this is uh, Occupy the Web. It's it's uh, it's great because um, you you don't want to give us your real name, and I understand about that. So perhaps you can give us a bit of your history, and then explain why you're very careful giving us your real name. Well, uh, first of all, I I used to teach at the university. Uh, yep. I, I taught computer science and cybersecurity, and then I started teaching. Uh, the U.S. military and intelligence and cybersecurity and hacking. And along the way, I have done a number of different projects, and I continue to do a number of projects, where if my identity were known, it would put myself and my family at risk, including the current project uh, to try to help save Ukraine from Putin's... Uh, malicious army. I, I can only feel comfortable doing this as I'm doing now yep. if I remain anonymous. But it's been other projects along you know in the past that also requires my anonymity. Before we talk about your latest project, I, I've, uh, I did a bit of research. You've got to tell us, how did you get into hacking and how long ago was that? Gosh, uh, it's been <laughs> almost 20 years now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it just see in all honesty, it's the, I was, I was, working in the university and it seemed to me that the most important thing in the world <laughs> was hacking <laughs> and <laughs> that was my estimation and and i think the events of the recent years tell us that that's that was accurate in my view that the hacking was is the most important skill set of the 21st century and i've said that over and over again and i think that the events of the last few days, the last few weeks have yep. emphasized that. And I think one of the things that we can do is to to try to slow down the Russian army is to make it very uncomfortable in the homeland by shutting down their internet access. And we've largely done that for the last two weeks. I mean, almost all of the internal uh, websites inside of Russia are inaccessible right now. So what I wanted to ask you, and I mean, this is a very direct question. So you and, and a group of you are, are hacking Russia at the moment, is that right? Let me uh, be clear. All yeah. right. When I say we, I'm not necessarily talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm talking about the hackers of the world. All yeah. right. And there's probably <laughs> a, a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's be clear. It's, when I say we, you know, it's the hackers of the world. And so there's maybe a hundred thousand of us, okay, yeah. who are working on this. Russia recently, I think it was on Friday released that they had identified 17,000 IP addresses that were hacking them. Okay? Yeah. I think there's a lot more than that. I can tell you almost for sure there's a lot more than that. But they've yeah. identified 17,000. That's a huge number. Okay, that's a huge number. It is. And I think that Russia never expected the response from the hacker community that they've got that many hackers join in this operation is like nothing has ever happened in the history of the world. Yeah, I mean, the world's changed, hasn't it? Because, I mean, we all yeah. connected and it's, um, I mean, I'll let you just discuss it. But I mean, um, rather than just fighting in the in the physical world, if you like, it looks like there's a huge amount of stuff happening in the virtual world. There's a lot going on in the virtual world. And it's it was kind of spontaneous. You know, yep. we, people communicated and they said, you know, we have the skills, we have to do something. Let's go and do whatever we can to be able to save the Ukrainian people. And I would make the case that we're not only saving the Ukrainian people, we're saving Europe, okay, and maybe even beyond those borders of Europe. Because Putin has set out to recreate, he has said this himself, he's trying to recreate the Russian Empire, okay, 
Yeah. And that goes long beyond the borders of Ukraine. And so if we allow him to take Ukraine, he will continue to take. And he has continued to take in the last 10 years, obviously. I mean, he took parts of Ukraine in 2014. You know, he, he's taken Syria, essentially. Right? He's taken Chechnya. At some point, we have to stop him and say, enough. You, know, you have to go back beyond inside your borders and leave us in peace. And since we can't, okay, most of us cannot, go to Ukraine and fight physically, and actually maybe our skills are actually more valuable than our skills as a soldier, yeah. to be able, to, we've been attacking internally into Russia. And it's largely been at this stage, early stage, is is a, a massive DDoS attack, a massive DDoS attack that has shut down everything. But that's not going to last. That's a very simple brute force attack, and Russia's responding now. Okay, so they are responding, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty easy to stop a massive DDoS attack. It's a simple brute force attack. You know, lots of that's part of their identifying the 17,000 IP addresses. They're going to start blocking them. Yeah. And they're in the process right now of putting a perimeter around Russia. So they're going to block anything coming in or out of Russia. So we have to go to plan B, okay, stage two of this attack. And I mean, I'm not, not, you're not going to share I, that, I'm, I'm assuming. I'm not going to mean, define, I'm not of gonna course. define that. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, you, it wouldn't be wise. So, um, from your point of view, so um, tell me, can you give us some examples of stuff that you've that you've been able to accomplish? I, um, I'm just looking at your website now, and on your website, hackersarise.com, you've got become a cyber warrior, stop Putin now, and um, I see you've got articles where you're talking about like radios, you're talking about like DDoSing. Can you give us some examples, and then I want to come back to this like definition of what is a white hat, uh, white hat uh, hacker. Well, I mean, when you said, once again, I'm going to say we in meaning yeah. everybody okay yeah. i'm not talking necessarily about myself okay sure. i'm talking about the almost a hundred thousand hackers who have participated in this event we okay have yeah. been able to hack russia today yeah. uh, the tv station and been able to put up information on that tv station to try to inform the people of russia that what they're getting internally is not true what they're getting i i've had russians send me what they're getting on television okay mm -hmm. what they're getting on television is that russia is the hero and is saving the people of ukraine from the nazis who are running ukraine that's what they're being told right yeah. that russia is saving them and they're being shown images of right-wing groups who apparently are attacking Russian speakers within within Ukraine. Now, I'm not denying that that has taken place, okay? But, I mean, that pl takes place in every country, right? Okay, I mean, it takes place in the U.S., it takes place in, in England, it takes place in South Africa, right? Yeah. Right-wing groups do crazy things, right? They do, yeah. They do. But that's not a rationale for basically turning Ukraine into rubble. Okay, and that's what they're doing. They're going to do to Ukraine what they did in Chechnya in Syria. They just basically flattened the whole country, and they've started that process, and the rest of the world has to respond, and we are doing what we can to get the information to the Russian people and also to make it as difficult for Putin and his thugs to be able to... Uh, continue their war in Ukraine. So it's a lot of DDoSing? Um, de right. Is it like defacing websites, stuff like that? Yeah, there's been a defacing, but there's also been DDoSing, because okay? so both things have been taking place. Because of the DDoS, okay, and it was so massive, that you can't really hack a system that you can't connect to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So the whole country has been DDoS, like 98%, okay? We can't even, you know, we, I mean, once again, the hacker collective <laughs> yep. can't even connect to these systems to be able to hack them. But once the once the DDoS subsides, right, then the next state, next level comes in. Next, the, the next round comes through. I would say that 
round one that we won round one okay yeah round one doesn't mean you win the fight right there's going to be a lot of rounds here round one was a massive ddos and now round two begins now russia is responding and, and responding in a smart way i mean they've got good people and they're basically going to put a fence entirely around russia and not allow in or out anything Okay, you know, that's not that hard to do, but it's going to take them a little while to do it. All right. And right now they're trying to block the IP addresses that are, are involved in the DDoS attack. Okay. And they're effectively doing that. They're slowly, you're starting to see the websites in Russia beginning to come back online. So so you think it's going to be like the Great Wall of China type thing? I think it's going to be very much like the Great Wall of China or Iran or what have you. It's not only going to be content filtering, it's going to be IP filtering. Yeah. So they're going to they're going to basically say any IP that is not inside Russia is not going to be allowed to access these websites. But there's ways around that. We won't go into any details, <laughs> but, but there are ways to get past that. Obviously, I mean, people in China get past it. Yeah. People from outside China get past it. Right? It's it's not the end of the game. Yeah, I mean, I um. So let's talk about our DDoS, and then I, I want to get to this white hack, white hat hacker thing. Um, I saw on your website, um, you were like giving some articles about um, like how to DDoS um and help in this, um, and specifically saying like use use specific websites or specific IP addresses. Is that right? So it doesn't get filtered as a external IP address. Right. So one of the, the tutorials I have on there is using ZMAP, which is a very powerful scanner that sends out huge volumes of packets very quickly. Yeah. And it's been, it's been used to be able to scan the entire internet in 45 minutes. Literally, you can scan the entire internet in 45 minutes with ZMAP. Yeah. So what I'm asking people to do is to use that tool to go in and send the traffic in, into Russia and then use a spoofed IP address, a Russian IP address, yeah. to send the traffic back to. So what you're doing is you're, you're basically amplifying a really powerful tool, and you're just creating a lot of traffic inside their networks. So if you were to use this tool, for instance, in your local area network, you would shut down your local area network. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so That's how powerful it is. You would, you would DOS everybody on your network. If you, by sending it all out into the Russian IP addresses and then having them all respond to one of the important IP addresses like the Moscow Stock Exchange or some of the military sites, those military sites are just getting massive amounts of traffic. Basically, it's just it's just a scan response, but it's too much yeah. traffic for the servers to handle. And essentially, we're just we're making them unaccessible. And this is why they're going to build that um, that wall to stop uh, external IP addresses or external right. traffic getting into the country. Right. That's what they're going to do. Now, we'll have to see because that, that technique that I put on my website is actually using a spoofed IP address. And one yeah. of the beauties of using a, a scanner tool or a DDoS scanner tool is that you can spoof the IP address. So it yeah. comes into their network looking like it's coming from inside their network. Yeah. It has a return IP address that's inside their network. So we'll see how well they can go ahead and uh, block the, that kind of traffic. So, I mean, on your website, it's a really interesting article. Um, you've got this thing, what is a white hat hacker? And your definition is, I would say, different to, you know, the sort of normal definition or well-known definition. So could you give us your definition and, and why you see it this way? Well, I've long held that the, the textbook definition of a white hat hacker is pretty limited. Yeah. it's And I think it grows out of, you know, the early days of, of hacking. So in the early days of hacking, most people associated hacking with an illegal activity. Yeah. And so people began to make a distinction and say, well, I'm not an illegal hacker. I'm a white hat hacker. I'm a good guy. And I agree that if you're doing pen testing or bug bounty hunting, what have you, that you are a white hat hacker. But yeah. if you have these skills, which very few people have, okay, it's a really small number of people in the world yeah. 
who have these skills, you have a responsibility that comes with that. And part of the responsibility that comes with being a white hat hacker and having these skills, which are very unique on the planet, you have a responsibility to work for freedom of information, for anti-aggression, for keeping the internet open and free. And you know, obviously, I would put in the category of, of stopping the aggression of uh, the Russians in Ukraine. I think that if you have those skills, you can't say, "Oh gosh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm busy." Yep. <laughs> you know? yep. I, uh, you know, you have a responsibility to help save the world with your skills, and I, I really seriously mean that. I mean, save the world. I think, and if you will just allow me a little bit to talk about politics, Putin is the greatest threat to the stability, okay, of the world as we know it, to our freedoms, and we can't sit still. I don't think that any of us should be sitting still. This is that important. If you have, I have been following this man intensely for his entire career. (laughs) Well, not his entire, his entire career. (laughs) For a long time, yeah. Yeah, his entire career as the president, premier of of Russia. And uh, he, he is set about to be able to rebuild the Ukrainian, Ukrainian, the Russian Empire, and and beyond. I, I think he definitely, if he gets Ukraine, he'll go after Moldova, Poland, all Estonia, the people. Some of those countries, yeah. Estonia, Latvia, yeah, yeah, exactly. All the countries that had previously been part of the Soviet bloc behind the Iron Curtain, and he may very well go beyond that. We have to stop him here. We have to stop him now. I think that the Russian people are good people. I'm in the U.S. I have lots of Russian friends. They're, they're good people. But Putin is not a good people. <laughs> yep. Putin, Putin is a psychopathic killer, and he has to be stopped. I think that the urgency of this is on on par with the urgency of stopping Hitler in 1939. And I've never said that before. Because I, no, I don't I'm, li- go, I'm I don't glad li- you're sharing it with us. Sorry, go on. I don't, I don't like Hitler type of analogies because everybody goes, oh, this is, this is bad as Hitler. You know, and then everybody just kind of goes over their head and rolls their eyes. This yeah. is as important as Hitler, okay, in 1939. And in 1939, they allowed Hitler to take part of Austria and then take Poland and everybody kind of said, "Well, okay, that's all right." You know, he's just—that's all he wants—is those little pieces. And then, of course, we know the rest of the story. That's the rest of the story here. If we don't act now, it's—I it, mean, I understand. It's like it, and I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's a—it's a manifesto or a, a way of belief to say, you as a hacker are responsible with your skills. You've been given these skills. You need to use it for good. Um, and you see this as really important um, to counter what's happening. Yeah, is that right? I do. I, I think that summarizes my beliefs perfectly. So, I mean, on the on your website, do you like teaching people to do things? Is that for like the Ukrainians or is that for like just general people around the world? You, I mean, you've got a lot of great content on your website. Thank you. Well, it's both. I mean, we're we're trying to help the people who are on the outside who want to participate in doing what they can. Okay. Yep. I mean, a lot of people, you know, have approached me. I get emails every day. What can I do to help? And so I, I'm trying to put some simple tutorials on there that this is what you can do to help. I've also started now directing tutorials towards the Ukrainian people. You know, we did one on how to DDoS. A, a, a wireless AP last yes, week, yep. but this week we're going to have one on how to jam the communications of the, the the Russian military. Okay, so look for that. We'll be we'll be jamming their military signals, and it's not that hard to do with a relatively inexpensive piece of equipment. We'll be using the Hack RF, and we'll be jamming their uh, communication signals. So this is something that you know somebody who's stuck in Kiev or Mariupol or whatever. And they have they have to have electricity, though. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that might be a big if, right? I mean, if they don't have electricity, they can't do this. But I'm assuming that if they have electricity, this is something we can do. We can jam their signals and make it impossible for them to communicate locally Okay, within Kiev and other places in in Ukraine. I was going to say, I'm sure I saw that somewhere where you were talking about using SDR, uh, software-defined radios, to to like listen in or confuse the signals. Is that right? 
Right. That's what we'll be doing. We'll be – right now, listening in is a little more complex because most of it is encrypted. All right, so you would have to decrypt the signal, right? Yep. But jamming it is pretty easy to do. It's once again, it's kind of like a DOS attack. It's kind of a brute yeah. force. You just send out a bunch of noise on their frequencies, right? So that they that those signals never make it, okay, to their destination. It's interesting because I um I saw the Ukrainian government, if if I'm correct, was asking hackers around the world to rise up and sort of follow and do what you're doing. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. One of the first things that happened when the war started is the Ukrainian government actually asked the hackers of the world, and the hackers of the world have responded. Okay? Yeah. And they actually have an IT army, they call it, the Ukrainian IT army that they are recruiting people to help with. And there, you know, a lot of Ukrainians with good IT skills have gone back to Ukraine to help in this effort. And then there's literally tens of thousands of hackers around the world who are helping the Ukrainian people. So, I mean, us IT people aren't necessarily the best on like on the battlefield, um, like right. fighting with <laughs> guns and stuff, but we've got these skills. So you, because the Ukrainian R- Ukrainians asked for help, hackers around the world like yourself, and I mean, you say we, a whole bunch of hackers around the world have risen to this challenge and are helping the Ukra- Ukrainians by dosing Russia doing things to you know you know to cause disruption is that correct in Ukraine and, and yeah, in Russia that's that's exactly what's going on is that the Ukrainians asked for our help and yep. there's probably never been in the history of the world okay a cyber war i can pretty much say with certainty there's never been a cyber war like this in the yeah. history of the world and there's never been a time when the hackers of the world have been so united okay yep against the common enemy. What do your Russian friends say about this? Um, and I mean, you, you can just talk generally, but I mean, like you, you say you've got Russian friends and stuff. How do they feel about you hacking their country? <laughs> it's a tough one, eh? Well, in all honesty, I haven't discussed that with them. <laughs> <laughs> but but in general, you know, the, the people who have left, I mean, I say Russian friends, okay? So I have friends in Russia who I no longer can talk to. Okay. And they're the ones who came out and immediately said to me, you're wrong. This is a defensive. This is a self defense action is what they're telling me. Yeah. And, and this is, you know, this is Putin and his people are, are justified in, in this self defense. That's what the Russians have been saying to me in the United States. The Russians generally don't like Putin. Okay, that's one of the reasons they they're in the United States and not in Russia, is they have left there because of, they felt like uh, Russia has become an authoritarian regime, which I think you can you can probably uh, confirm that yeah that it's it's an authoritarian regime and and Putin would like to put Ukraine and the others in a in a authoritarian regime like he's done to say Belarus or other yeah. places. I I heard an interview a while back where um. You, I think you were talking about this book that you wrote. Um, mm-hmm. And I think you mentioned, um, so I'm going to ask you about what happened to you. And then I just want to like talk about like general people. Have you ever been visited by like a three letter agency and worried about your safety, like in the stuff that you've done? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So there, there's a risk, isn't there? So isn't there a risk? You know, let's say I'm some guy at home or someone at home. And I've decided, okay, I want to help. And I started attacking Russia. Isn't there a huge risk to me and my family? And if there is, how do I mitigate that? Okay, well, you know, usually I would say, yes, there is a huge risk. But right now, most of the governments around the world are, we're all on the same side. I sincerely doubt that there's going to be a risk to me and to others from our internal law enforcement. Now, okay. There might be a risk if Russia wins this war, right? <laughs> if, if Russia wins the war, then the soldiers who participated, us, okay, we then are under risk from, from Russia. That's why the, the beauty of the DDoS attack okay, that I put up on Hackers Arise is that you spoof. In other words, you use a different IP address, okay? Yeah. So if you use a different IP address, then it's going to be traced back 
to that IP address and not your own. Are of ISPs around the world blocking your traffic and stuff, or was it like just everything's just going through? I mean, I know Russia trying to block it, but um, have, you, have you heard anything like if I decided to do this in, from the UK and just like start launching an attack? Well, let's say the US, because you're based in the US. Um, yeah. Is it just uh, going through, yeah? Right now it is. Right now it is. I, I Before I published that that article a couple of days ago, whatever it was, I tested it and it was going right through. But I haven't, uh, because of circumstances that you are aware of, I was yeah. out of town this weekend and uh, I haven't haven't had time to test it uh, today. So I, I can't update you it may be i know that they're trying to block the ip addresses i know they're trying to put this fence around ukraine around russia but i haven't tested it yet today so i can't say for certain well in a ddos attack you know you don't have to have your ip address you know you don't have to use your ip address because you don't want the traffic to come back to you right so that's the beauty of a ddos attack and that's why that's why it was so effective, I think, in this case. I think it overwhelmed. Russia had no idea. They had no idea. And they were not expecting this type of DDoS attack. But they are now, right? Yeah. So that's that's where we have to go to phase two and phase three. How the do one you – sorry, sorry I, please I, go, I, on, go on. Go yeah, on, one thing I am concerned about, and I keep on emphasizing to people, is that the Russians have – back doors into thousands of machines in the West, okay? We know that they have been hacking these systems, and they've got back doors, and they haven't used them yet, all right? So we have to be careful. We have to be on alert that these systems could start going down or be used for malicious purposes. And some of them are inside of industrial control systems. We know they're inside these industrial control systems. So far, they haven't done it. They haven't done anything yet. And I think I think that's kind of like a nuclear option that they have, you know, mm-hmm. that they can start taking down the electricity grid, the water systems, the manufacturing plants, the chemical plants, the refineries. I think that's a very real risk. But so far, and we can probably, you know, say a prayer <laughs> that, that they don't because it's it could get really mean and nasty. Now, they've done this to Ukraine. I mean, a lot of people don't know that the Russians have been hacking the industrial control systems of Ukraine for 10 years. Okay. Oh, wow. yeah. they, they turned off the lights. Yeah. Okay. They've they've turned off the ATMs. They you know, they've been doing this you know for ten year, almost ten years now in Ukraine, and they haven't yet done it in any large scale in the rest of the West. But I think if they if they begin to lose this war, okay, and I think they will, that they will use that option. So when you say the war, you're talking about the cyber war or the or the the physical war or both? Well well I think it's one war with different yeah. elements of it, right? Yeah. I mean any war has multiple elements to it. So when I say yeah. the war, I, I've begun to refer to this as the the great cyber war of 2022, but it's only really one element of an overall conflict, right? Yeah. You know, in any war, there's multiple elements that are contending against each other. And we are the cyber war. Now, I, I should also point out that the intelligence agencies are not sitting still. I mean, they've been very quietly doing their thing, okay? And we're yeah. going to begin. We're going to begin to see their actions as well. So yeah. So I, let's talk about two things. So I mean, you're talking about like the industrial systems being at risk. I also saw you had a good article where you're talking about like finding outdated and vulnerable systems in Russia. So you, I think you said that like Putin's using an XP computer or something. Um, or that's <laughs> yeah. something like that. He is, he is. He is. His 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 computer on his desk is running XP. Very secure but, then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and of course XP is you know is not been yeah. updated for a while. Um, but there's also a lot of you know a lot of people don't know that there's a lot of old systems around the world. People, yeah, you know because because those of us who are in this industry, right, we, we tend. And I'm not one of them, though. I will tend to always get the latest and greatest and and always update and always yeah. do the secure updates, what have you. But not everybody in the world does. Okay, And that's part of what that article was to try to demonstrate is that don't assume that they're running Windows 11. Right? Yeah. If they're running if they're running Windows XP or Windows 7, those are very insecure systems. All right. And if you can connect to them, they're not that hard to take out. No, it doesn't take an it doesn't take a, a expert hacker to take out an XP system. 
You know, <laughs> an XP system can be taken out by just about anybody. So, I mean, on your website, you've got these training manuals is what I'd probably call them about things that people can do, like um, attacking like XP computers or old computers, DOSing, doing things like that. But there's a risk, isn't there, like you said, of escalation. Like if everyone's attacking Russia, they could start like doing lots of attacks on the on the West. Um, but I mean, I suppose you could say to that, and I'm, I don't want to answer the question, I'll let you do it, but like, they've been doing that already. Yeah? We haven't seen any significant attacks coming out of Russia. I think they really got caught by surprise. Okay? okay. They got they got caught by surprise. They had no idea. Putin is basically taking down the head of the SSB FSB on Friday or Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> and and he did that I in part because he was given poor intelligence. Okay. Yeah. This massive DDoS attack Russia did not expect. And so we haven't seen much in response yet, but we are likely to see, and that's why I keep on emphasizing this to people, is you're likely to see a response soon. All right. Yeah. Be alert. Be aware. Okay. You especially if you're in the industrial control systems. You, know, you have to be vigilant at this point. Okay, we're counting on you. Okay, we we can't go, we can't fight a war without electricity. Right? Yeah. If if they turn off the light, we can't do our job. So, and of course, this applies to Ukraine as well. But yeah, I think we're gonna next the next round we're gonna see a significant retaliation by yeah. the Russians. It may not be SCADA ICS industrial control systems. Because I think they know that that's kind of the nuclear option, yep. right? Because if they do that, we will go after their uh, industrial control systems, right? Yeah. And my assessment, having done industrial control systems for some time, is I've been watching, you know, I test these systems remotely all the time. And I noticed in the last, mm, especially in the last three or four years, that the Russian systems have gotten more and more secure. And I, I, I meant to publish that when I found, when I, when I did that research. And I never did because I got tied up with other things, you know. And, and really, yeah. at that time, nobody really cared, right? It wasn't yeah, that important. Do. Yeah, now they do, right? But the Russian systems, industrial control systems, are far more secure than they are in the West. I mean, you oh, can, wow. Okay. You can punch holes in European and the U.S., systems really easily it's harder you find very fewer systems in russia that you can easily punch a hole in okay and that, it's been a process that they've been going through for about three or four years maybe a little longer than that but now when i test those systems i see very few insecure systems in russia i see a lot of insecure systems I mean, I'll give you an example, and I probably I don't know, Poland has a lot of insecure systems. Okay, uh -huh, yeah. I've tested the Polish systems, and they are there's a lot of insecure systems with a lot of vulnerabilities in them. I'm sure I'm I'm not I'm not letting telling the Russians anything they don't already know. Okay, <laughs> but you know they could turn out the lights in Russia in in Poland. Russia could turn out the lights in Poland pretty easily. Okay, wow, that's so that's scary. Yeah, yeah. It, it is scary, you know, and especially since you know, kind of Poland's on the front lines here, and they're yeah. taking millions of of refugees. So I had a really nice message from somebody in Poland the other day that I just wanted to recount. And uh, a fellow in Poland wrote me a message that he said um, he said I just ordered your book and it just arrived, but I'm not going to have a chance to read it because I have a 15 year old Ukrainian refugee. Who just came and is living in my house, oh. and he and he wants nothing more than to retaliate against the Russia. So I gave him your book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool story. Which book is that? Is that the the Linux Basics for Hackers, or is it your newer book? It, no, it's a Linux Basics for Hackers. That's the yep. place to start. You know, if you're trying to become a hacker, that's the place to start. You got to master Linux first, right? Yeah. You really can't do much. I mean. People often say, well, what can I do with Windows? Well, not much yep. is the answer, right? So that's why I wrote that book because the reason I wrote that book, it, it grew out of my teaching military and intelligence hackers. And, these, yeah. and, and many times these are very intelligent people who have no experience with Linux. And so that's amazing, I, yeah. I, yeah, I'd go into a, a, a situation where I was training people and they had, they had 
maybe a little bit of experience or no experience with Linux. So it became really clear to me that when I would go and do a training, I'd spend the first day just doing a, a quick and dirty, you know, this is Linux, this is how it works, right? Yeah. And um, then they would be, you know, it would work a lot better. And so the book kind of grew out of my quick and dirty Linux lessons that I would do for the military when I was doing trainings. And the, the good folks at No Starch Press, which, you know, I have to really give kudos to because they saw the value of that as well and asked me if I would turn it into a book. And it's been a, it's been a great seller. It's a great book. I, 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 I like it a lot. It's a good book. Thanks. So I'll recommend it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay, go on. Great. Uh, so, anyways, they No Starch Press, you know, saw the value in it. Asked me if I would make a book out of it, and uh, I did. That's, that's the end of the story. No, no. I mean, it's it's we're going on a tangent here, which is great. Um, I love it when we, you know, we just flow. I wanted to let, let's ask this, and then I'll come back to some of some of the other questions. So, if you want to be a hacker, let's say you want to hack Russia or whatever, or you decide that you want this is the field that you want to get into. First thing you'd recommend is learn Linux. Yeah. Yeah, I think the first thing is learn Linux because almost all of the hacking tools are Linux-based, right? There's a good reason for that because it, Linux being an open source operating system allows us transparency to the operating system, that we yeah. can use the tools to access the operating system, that kind of access that we wouldn't get in other operating systems. Yeah. And so that's why it's crucial that you need to use Linux. Now, there are, you know, there are some tools that are out there that can work in a Windows environment, but they're pretty limited. I mean, it's like, you know, five or 10 tools, right? <laughs> and, and that's fine if you want to just do one or two things. But if you really want to become proficient in this field, you really need to master Linux first. I mean, I don't mean to, to be you know, self-promotion, but my little Linux for Basics hack, Linux Basics for Hackers book, is only a small fraction of what you of, of Linux skills and knowledge, right? And I basically condensed it down into a very key areas of what you absolutely need to know, right? That's I mean, good. It's only like two hundred pages, so it's, it's like, only two hundred pages. It's not right? long, yeah. And, and that was our goal. Our goal was to keep it under two hundred and fifty pages and to make yeah. it accessible. I mean, we all know there's books probably on your shelf behind you there yeah. that are yeah. a thousand a thousand page books right. on Linux, right? Yeah. You know, so but nobody ever reads those books. That's a problem, <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. You might use it as a reference. Right to go look up something once in a while, but nobody ever reads them. I mean, I have them on my shelf too. So the idea when we went into is writing the book was let's make it small and concise and accessible, so that we just provided the information that you need to get started, rather than you know using putting everything about Linux into it, which you know nobody's going to end up reading it. No, I like it. It's a good book, and it's exactly as you say. I mean, it covers a lot of stuff like Bash, um, scripting, stuff like that. I I'd recommend this book myself. So Linux and then? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one. I mean, okay, so I'm going to ask you, let me ask you a question because I've, I've heard you give your opinion on this. What's your opinion of CH? My opinion of CH? CH, Is that what yeah. you asked? Yeah, Cisco, what, sorry, I'm the certified ethical hacker, sorry. Oh, C E H. Sorry, C E H. Yeah, my, -E my bad. My bad uh, accent. Yeah. <laughs> One of the first I just got done saying is that you need to master Linux first, yeah. and the C E H is everything is done in Windows, right? And a person can earn the C E H without ever knowing anything about Linux. And in all honesty, C E H really doesn't test your hacking skills. It tests your knowledge about hackers and yeah. hacking. You know, it doesn't. Yeah. You you don't have to hack anything to earn a CH. You just have to memorize the answers to some questions yeah. and be able to identify some tools. Personally, if somebody came to me and said, "I have a CH and I want a job as a hacker," I would say, "You're not ready. You know of." hacking you don't know how to hack so give us your path or any certs that you like or any books i mean let's say your recommendation start with this linux basics for hacking mm -hmm. um, or for hackers should i say what would you recommend next so this let's use this example this um i think you said 15 year old in poland from the ukraine he wants to get into it now what would right. you advise well i mean i certainly would advise you know, mastering linux first obviously yeah. um, i've got a lot of i mean i can promote my own website. You can promote anything you want, so go for it. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I I would say, you know, 
find yourself a, a good website with good tutorials. One of them is going to be Hackers Arise. Yep. I have I have another book out called um, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker. I have another book coming out. It's called Network Basics for Hackers. Yep. It's going to be similar to Linux Basics for Hackers, except it's going to just cover networking and the flaws and weaknesses in those networking protocols that yeah, a hacker good. can can exploit. I also should point out that getting started becoming master hacker is being we're redoing it with no starch press. Okay, yeah, so yeah. it's going to come out and it's going to be updated and uh, it's going to come out later this year from no starch with probably a different name. We haven't settled on a title for it yet, so look for that. Uh, those two will both be coming out later this year. But you know, there's uh, one of the things that you need to do as a hacker is to to be able to play, as I call it. Yep. <laughs> you need to play. You need to you need to practice your skills. So there's a number of sites online that have CTFs, okay, that you can practice your skills with. Hack the box, also, try hack me, that kind of thing. Yeah. That exactly. Yeah. And there's also you can you can put up a vulnerable virtual machine. Yep. So, you know, you can try hacking that, but that's that's kind of important to, to be able to not just read stuff in a book, right, and pass exams, but actually do it, right? Because there's nothing like doing it. But you need yep. to have some background first. Okay, you need to do some reading, do some studying, but then you need to hone your skills on virtual machines or try hack me or other places that have these machines that can be uh, hacked of course there's also all of those many of those systems you can actually download yeah. okay and put them on a create a virtual machine and then hack them on your own local system whenever you want so i, I really emphasize that they need to hone their skills by actually doing and that's yeah. that's really the biggest problem with the ceh is there's no requirement that you have you can hack anything. <laughs> There's no requirement that you hack anything. It's just you need to know the right terminology. That's basically all it is, is terminology of hacking and white hat hacking, penetration yep. testing, yep. what have you. Yeah, I mean, so it's not it's not practical. Uh, I know they've got a practical cert out now. The, the original or pure CH isn't uh, isn't practical. What it's about OSCP? Cool. What do you think of that? OS, OSCP is a good is a good certification. I think it's one of the most valuable certs out there. So, so, so if you were hiring, let's say theoretically, and if someone had an OSCP, you would look at them, yeah. I would look at them seriously. Yeah, an OSCP is 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 a much more practical certification, and it would definitely get my attention. Yep. Okay, and say this is a person who who is invested significantly in developing their skills because the OSCP is a it's not you know it's not something that you go to a class for a weekend and then you pass the exam on Monday yep. right you're investing significant amounts of time and energy into passing the OSCP any other certs that you'd recommend because some people would be you know it's as, as a first cert OSCP might be a bit scary it is EJPT first... or like uh, net security plus a lot of, I mean people would complain some of those or EJPT I... is more practical but like a security plus isn't well security plus is is concepts also also, yeah, you know, there's, yeah. no, there's no practical, but it's a good place to get, you know, if you're looking at just security concepts, yeah. right? To so start, if you yeah. Really, yeah, if you're just starting out, Security Plus is a good place to go because, you know, you're going to be, you're suddenly going to be thrown into this world of security if you're not familiar with it about, yeah. at least from the defensive side, how are people securing their systems? And of course, if you're going to be able to be able to actually hack systems you have to understand the defenses that are in place right yep. so if you're playing football or you're playing basketball you're not going to have a whole lot of success at offense if you don't understand the other team's defense yep. right? so, yep. so and, and vice versa right so if you're playing defense so if you're out there and you're you're trying to defend your systems against attack the first thing you need to know is you need to know how are the people on the other side, how are they attacking me? What are they trying to do? If I know those things, I can better defend my systems. And that's one of the things that I recommend to people who are on the defensive side. You need to understand at least some of this yeah. so that you can better defend these systems. And quite frankly, I see an awful lot of people on the defensive side, on the security side, who really don't understand hacking. And they're just following cookbook procedures and protocols 
with their firewall and their IDS and what have you. And they don't really understand the process that the hacker is undertaking to get inside their system, which would help them better defend their systems. It's a great it's a great thing to say. And that gets us sort of back to what I was going to ask you earlier, which was, I, was, I wrote this question down, has the West been asleep? Has the West been asleep? Yeah, like to what's <laughs> going on. Because you said like, you know, the, Russia's been improving their security in the last, say, I think you said three to four years, something like that on their control systems, but the West or like Poland is, it hasn't. Um, so, I mean, I just say generally have a lot of countries like the US, UK, others been, you know, a bit lax. Well, I think, yes, I think all of us have been a bit lax. And yeah. uh, I think all of us understood, underestimated the evil of Putin. And I say Putin and I don't say Russia, okay, because yeah. I don't think, Russians in general are bad people. Okay, I think Putin is a bad guy. <laughs> I think Putin's people are bad people. Okay, yeah. but not necessarily the Russians. And so I think we all were taken by surprise by how aggressive and how brutal Putin's army <laughs> has yeah. been in Ukraine. So. I think we haven't taken enough defensive measures against them. But I think, you know, hopefully we are now. But Putin knew this was part of a plan. All right. And so I started noticing three or four years ago that their industrial control systems got more and more secure. So this was part of a not, you know, this, this didn't just happen overnight. He's been planning this for some time. We need to be on alert okay now and be vigilant but unfortunately there's already back doors yep. shell code whatever you want to call it inside these systems they're already there and so if you haven't gone in and started extracting these back doors and shell code you're going to get hammered here soon you likely to get hammered here soon. Remember Solar Winds, right? Yep, Solar Winds yep. was just a, example, just, yeah. a, just a year ago, right? Yep. And administrators across the board, many, I don't, but many use Solar Winds. Luckily, I don't use Solar Winds, okay? But yep. Solar Winds turns out good products. I'm not going to knock it. I just yep. don't use them. Solar Winds turns out good products. And uh, and so everybody who's using Solar Winds suddenly has a Russian backdoor implanted in their system. And if you haven't gone in looking for it and extracted it or blocked it, you're at risk. I mean, and it's that, worrying. Be, sorry, go on. No, go that's on. thousands of systems. That's yeah. thousands of systems. And they're largely large corporations and government. They're not mom and pop. Mom and pop are not using solar winds. Right? Yep. Who's using solar winds are the big corporations and government. And so those are the people who likely have access to the Russians right now. It's a wake up call, isn't it? I mean, Germany changed tact dramatically with what's happened. I mean, shipping. Uh, shipping arms, arms for the first and time. Also, yeah, ex exactly. And also, like, increasing the spending dramatically. Right. Um, go I on. mean, German, Germany has, has awakened. And Germany, that's a good thing, obviously, because they're right on the front lines, right? Yeah. You and I are not on the front lines. Germany is on the front lines. And, uh, you know, they have, Germany has long relied upon the belief that if they were attacked, that uh, the rest of NATO would respond. And that's probably true. Right. And plus, they have a significant number of military installations, U.S. military installations going back to World War Two. But at the same time, you know, it's uh, being on the front lines, you know, sharpens your focus and they've begun to spend more on defense. Now, I, I probably should explain. I, I want to make sure that listeners don't see me as a warmonger because I'm basically I'm I'm a pacifist. <laughs> I mean, I, I, until now, <laughs> I, I am a pacifist. Okay, yeah. but I have a I have an old friend. This is a long time ago. Now, an old friend who was a conscientious objector yeah. during World War II, and one of the things he used to say to me is, he says, "I'm I still struggle." I still struggle with that decision to have chosen to not fight during World War II. I still struggle. And it's always stuck in my mind that there are some times that you have to fight. Okay, There's some times where you have to fight. When evil enters your backyard, Okay, you have to fight. Right? And this is that's the case now. We, we have evil 
who has entered our backyard, and we have to fight. Even the pacifists among us have to fight now. I, I understand the you know the the rally call to, and why you're doing this and why you know like you said, a hundred thousand other people are doing it. Um, I think it's shocked many, many people, especially in Europe. I think a lot of people in Europe were very taken back by this. And I mean, the Germany response is a, is a, is a fine example of that. Right. Um, so right. do you see, let's look at this from like an individual point of view. Um, there's been this huge sort of um, interest in cybersecurity, uh, whatever you want to call it, cyber in the last few years. Um, do you see this as only escalating that? Yes, I think it. I think this emphasizes how important, and as this war goes on, I think we're going to see more cyber. As yeah. I've said before, we're going to see more cyber, and it's going to become really clear. You know, I've been publishing articles for a while now in different yeah. places about the fact that we should expect a cyber war. Okay, we should expect it. That I don't see how you could not expect it to take place. And so yeah. in reality, we've been involved in a quiet cyber war between all the major groups in the world. Right? I mean, Russia hacks Western Europe, the U.S., you know, whoever, whoever they feel they can gain some advantage from. China's hacking everybody. You know, the U.S. is hacking darn near everybody, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, you know, so I, I acknowledge that the U.S. is, you know, is one of those actors out there, right? The, yep. You know, as the NSA and the CIA and others, the U.S. Cyber Command are out there hacking whenever they feel like they need to hack, right? So this has been going on for a while. This is not anything new, but it's been done quietly. And uh, especially if it's, you know, if you're an American citizen, you don't hear anything about American hacking. Hacking. But I will reassure you that the Americans are hacking and that there are some really, really good hack working for U.S. intelligence. Okay, I has, That kind of grows out of a comment that a discussion I had with a friend this weekend at the funeral yeah. was he was like, well, I don't think the American hackers are, are up to fighting the Russians or whoever. And I said, you're wrong. <laughs> the American hackers are really good, okay, but they do their work quietly, and you will see if this thing escalates how good they are. Um, I think Russia knows how good the U.S. intelligence agency's hackers are, and that if they were to pull the trigger on the industrial control systems, they would see the response by the American and Western hackers, not just the U.S., that they would obliterate the industrial control systems of Russia, okay? And that they don't want. They know, okay, that if they, it's kind of like a nuclear weapon, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you launch a nuclear weapon, you can be sure that you're going to get a response of a nuclear weapon, right? So you don't launch a nuclear weapon. That's the same with the industrial control systems. If Russia chooses to launch that weapon, the response is going to be overwhelming, Okay, to their industrial control systems. They know that, and so right now they're not launching it. Okay, but we still have to be vigilant that they may. What happens when the Great Wall of Russia is built, as an example? Well, the Great Wall of Russia, I mean, any wall, as you know, yep. okay, as you know, any wall can be gone around, gone over, go yeah. under, or gone through. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we just have to find which one of those paths is the easiest okay around over or through so we'll uh, we'll figure out a way so tell me this because let's say i'm interested in doing this but i'm i'm worried how do you stay anonymous online or how do you cover your tracks i mean ddos is is, is easy like you said you change your ip address or whatever like what tools do you use or recommendations do you have is it tor what do you use to stay anonymous or hide well in this case you know tor works pretty well when you're attacking russia okay so tor works tor within the United States is is risky because the NSA has has exit nodes in the United States and they can trace those <laughs> exit heard, nodes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they do. I I can tell you this this is a story. Go for well, it. I was, Go. I was I was I like stories. I was, Go on. I, I was I was doing a training at one of those three letter agencies. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a few years back, okay? And uh, I haven't I haven't done any trainings for them in five or six years now. So um, I was at one of those three-letter agencies, and you know I had been playing on the dark web. And from my location, using Tor is pretty slow, 
Right? Yeah. And I don't know what other people have experienced. Okay, because basically you're using a fraction of somebody else's computer that's working as a router. Right, and depending upon how much bandwidth there's being allowed through, it can be pretty slow. It's a good masking technique, but it can be slow. So I was at this three-letter agency, and uh, I wanted to do a demonstration on what's available you know, on dark web. And so I, I load up my Tor browser and it zooms. I mean, it's going <laughs> so fast. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is this is faster than my regular internet, right? And that was my first wake-up call that the three-letter agencies have exit nodes and entry nodes, okay, on the Tor network. So... You have to be aware of that. If it's something that will get you in trouble with the three-letter agencies in your home country, then Tor may not be the best. Okay. okay. Usually, the best way, you know, to be able to stay anonymous is to use a proxy from outside of your country. Now, it used to be the best proxies were in Russia. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, the best proxy and Ukraine. Those were the two countries who had the best proxies because they, for whatever reason, you know, the Russians made these proxies available, probably for data gathering. Who knows what why they did? But there was all these proxies available in Russia and in Ukraine that you could use to carry on your activities on the net and it always would be traced back to a proxy in those countries and not to your home country. And so that's why attribution in any kind of hack becomes really difficult because you'll get an IP address that links to, say, Russia or Ukraine, but it doesn't mean that that attack is coming from that country. Yeah. And it's really hard then to go past and through the proxy, although if the proxy gets a subpoena or... or you know, the FBI shows up at their door or some other law enforcement shows up at their door and they can then, if there's logs, if there are logs, they can go through the logs and see what IP address is associated with that IP address leaving the proxy. But if it's if the proxy is sitting in a country where your nation has no jurisdiction, like in the past, Russia, and still true today, <laughs> your your nation's law enforcement is going to have any jurisdiction in Russia. Those proxies were pretty safe. So that's you know if you're if you have to do hacking, those proxies are the best. They have been the best. I can't say about the future right now. When you say proxy, are you talking like you're talking about a VPN? Just to you make sure everyone understands. Yeah, you're talking about like opening up a VPN via that it's, proxy. It's, is that it's, right? It's it's very similar to a, a VPN. Right. So basically. Proxy is you're connecting to another system in another country, in another location. And like a VPN, it then uses its IP address for the traffic that leaves it. Right? Which software are you using? Just say if someone's interested in doing this. Because, I mean, my, my big point about this is let's say someone's interested in this and now they, you know, they okay, you've, you've kind of told people be careful of Tor. So that was like right. the first thing. What, what do they use? I think I actually included in Linux Basics for Hackers. I made, I, I gave them a warning against Tor as well. Yep. Well, I would use proxy chains. Yeah. Proxy chains. Proxy chains is a very simple tool. It allows you to go ahead and, and connect to proxies. And all you got to do it has a configuration file, a simple configuration file that you just need to you need to one put in the IP addresses of your proxies, and you need to tell it you know what kind of chain you're building. And that's basically all you have to do. It's pretty simple to use. Now that's great because I think um, a lot of people that's the first thing they're going to going to say is okay, I'll use Tor, but if Tor is dodgy, then um, then I'll use proxy chains. So I'm glad you've mentioned like specifically. And is there anything else that you would uh, recommend doing? No, no, I would say that Tor is pretty safe in this cyber war okay, yeah. against Russia. So that caveat about Tor doesn't really apply in this situation. Okay, yeah. In this situation, you know, you're, you're going to be pretty anonymous on the Tor network. That means that NSA might know what you're doing, but that's okay. Because <laughs> NSA, NSA is NSA is on your side. We're on the same side in this fight, right? In general, I would say in, in this circumstance, you're not going to have to fear the NSA or the CIA or the FBI. I mean, I think that. I mean, I, I, I was talking to some hacker friends the other day, and we were kind of 
reveling that this is the first time in our life that we get to hack and not have to worry about law enforcement. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> we can we can do anything we want now. You know, we just throw the whole kitchen sink at them. It's it's our time. But I I read somewhere or heard somewhere that you got into hacking originally because you did something in your in your teens or when you were young. Is that right? That got you into trouble. Is that is that correct? <laughs> Well, okay. that was sort of your like way to get into hacking. No, actually, that's the way that it's it's. I I know the interview you're talking about. Now. <laughs> yeah. So without telling saying too much, is that I actually got myself into trouble when you were younger. And when I was younger, and so it's one of the reasons I stay anonymous. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I ended up going in some places that I shouldn't have been. Let's put it that way, and without yeah. taking necessary precautions against, against protecting my identity. Yeah. And as a result, um, bad things happened, <laughs> and uh, and so it's one of the reasons that I'm I'm particularly cognizant of trying to remain anonymous. And I think that this war has once again emphasized why it's important to maintain anonymity because uh, nobody wants to have a cruise missile landing in their yard. You don't want the Russian army or the Chinese army um, knocking on your door. You know, they they may they may be uh, look like local folks, but uh, they have ill intent. And uh, yeah, I, I go to great lengths to maintain my anonymity for that reason. So proxy chains, any other advice then to maintain? No, I think, I think that for most people that's going to work. You know, in this case, Tor is going to work for you. You only, once again, that if you're using Tor to DDoS, remember that you have limited bandwidth on Tor. Yeah. So you're not going to be as effective using Tor to ban- to do a DDoS attack, right? So you want as much bandwidth as you can, you can get to do a DDoS. That's that's part of what you're, you're trying to create so much traffic. If you're using Tor and you have really limited bandwidth, that's not probably the tool you want to use, yeah. in which case then you want to use something like proxy chains. And would you recommend like um, installing Linux on a on a computer and using that as your as your main computer? Or what would you recommend? Well, I for people who are learning, I recommend that they use something like uh, VirtualBox or yep. VMware Workstation. They, they, they work pretty well. They've these virtual machines have come a long way in have, yeah. recent years. Yeah, I mean, it used to be they were really balky and hard to work with, and now they're they're pretty transparent and and pretty easy to work with. So the beauty of using them is that, one, if you, you're a Windows user and you're trying to learn Linux, you don't have to convert maybe your only system over to Linux before you're ready to. So, and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to move your files and, you know, all your applications. So you can go ahead and just download VirtualBox from Oracle's website. It's free. VMware Workstation is probably preferable if you're willing to spend $300. I think it works better. Uh, But VirtualBox is free, and um, Oracle does a pretty good job with it. It has some some quirks like any software does. And then you can run your Kali or whatever operating system you want in a virtual machine while still maintaining your Windows 10, Windows 11 system, you don't have to make the conversion immediately. And and actually, you can use that virtual machine to do a DDoS attack. You know, it works pretty well, even from a virtual machine. What happens is the virtual machine then connects through your wired or wireless connection, and it almost works seamlessly from the... Uh, virtual machine out to your internet connection. Yeah, they so work really good these days. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, they work. They work really good these days. Yeah, so you don't have to go ahead and say, "Oh, I'm going to go all Linux right now," which some, it's hard for some people to do because you know they, they got applications, they got data, all in a Windows machine. Go ahead and download VirtualBox. You know, then download you know a Linux operating system. I prefer Kali. I'll just use others and and get yourself familiar with you know these linux operating systems and that's the first step right and you know if you want to participate you, know, you can participate even from a virtual machine so that's great i mean i was going to ask you the next the next question i was going to ask you is which operating system and you've already answered that so Kali's your favorite yeah well i like debian a yeah. lot and you know it's, i've been using debian for i don't know 15 years right yeah. so i mean i i've used other unix operating systems over the years so 
you know, back in the 90s, I actually was uh, on IRIX and HPUX. Uh, oh, HP. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know IRIX? No, I don't, uh, I, I've, heard, I've heard of it. I haven't used it. But, uh, uh, IRIX yeah. was, is still, it's still around. It's the operating system of the silicon graphics machines. Yes. So yeah, my yeah. my first my first use of Unix was actually on silicon graphics machines. Wow. Way back way back. Yeah. And uh, and so HPUX, a little bit of BSD, and then when you know Linux started growing, I I've been a dedicated Debian user and I like Debian. I like it's simple, it's clean, lightweight, relatively lightweight. It's not as lightweight as some others. And it works well for, I think, hacking. So Kali is built on Debian, for those who aren't familiar. The Kali is built on Debian, and you can put any tool you want, basically, into it. You know, there's, it comes pre-built with tools. But you can download and install any tools that you want into Kali if there's something else that you really like. There's a lot of tools in the repository that aren't built directly into Kali. And, of course, you can always get a bunch of tools off GitHub. So I'm going to ask you some quick-fire questions, and I appreciate you taking so much time. Um, I, am I too old to get into hacking if I'm in my 30s or 40s? I get this question a lot. I, I get the question a lot, too. And yeah. uh, I have many people that I work with Okay, who started in their 40s. Okay, well, yeah. so, yeah. So it, 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 people often assume that it's only a profession for very young people. Okay, yep. and it's not. Okay, I would say, yes, 30s and 40s is just fine. I actually have a guy right now who just started in his 50s. So, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So it's, but he has a, he has an IT background, right? Yeah. And he's coming to hacking in his 50s. So lots of people in their 30s and 40s, I don't think, I mean, I would make the case that it's never, you're never too old <laughs> to become a hacker, so. Yeah, I mean, you, you have this mystique about it, don't you? Pizza, you like Mr. Robot and stuff like that. You know, you, you're this young guy and you're doing all these crazy things. But it, I mean, from what you're saying, that there's a lot of opportunities, is that right? Even if you're a bit older. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities. You know, it's sometimes when it's when you're older, it's harder yeah. to to commit the time and energy that requires to become really good at it. But if you are, I don't see any reason why any age cannot make the transition to white hat hacking, as we'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, stay there for now. And, yeah. So yes, I, I I don't see age as a as a detriment at all. Okay. Although you know, generally the the mystique and the image that people have of a hacker is the you know the hoodie wearing yep. young person in their mother's basement, you know, in the dark. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But but that's not the case. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, you've got a lot of friends in this community um, and they're all different ages, different types of people. Is that right? Yes. And they're from lots of different backgrounds. Yep. Ages from, I mean, I have teenagers to in their 50s. Nobody in their 60s, I don't think, but up from, from lots of... You know, there's an awful lot of young people who want to become hackers, right? Yeah. And they want it right now. <laughs> and that's, that, that, that's, that is, that, that's the drawback of being 15, 16 years old and going into hacking is that they want it now, okay? Yeah. And, and not necessarily realize that it's really a multi-year commitment, okay, to become really good at it and make it into a career. Generally, the older students are a little more patient with it. Yep. And they're, they're willing to commit the time that it takes to become really good at it. So there's advantages to being, you know, very young. And your mind is quick and nimble, and uh, you, get, you can grasp things very quickly. Uh, but the older hackers tend to be more committed and realize that it's not all going to happen right now. I mean, they've been around for a while. They know to become good at things. I mean. There's that old um, adage that uh, Malcolm Gladwell, I think, is the one who popularized. And he, he popularized this notion that it takes 10,000 hours yeah. to become an expert at anything. So 10,000 hours is about five years, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you really want to become a great hacker, or if you want to be great at anything, you have to commit 10,000 hours. That's not me saying that. That's other experts saying it. And I would say that's probably true. That's five years of full-time work. Okay. Now, some people might be able to do it in three years, and some people might take them six years. Okay. But that gives you a ballpark if you want to become an expert. It doesn't mean it's going to take that long 
to help in this war. I mean, in this war, you know, you could put up some tools in a matter of hours or days and learn how to use them and participate in this war. Yeah. But if you want to become an expert, then think about 10,000 hours. I and mean, that's a good ballpark of what it takes. So tell me about Hackers Arise, because um, you've got a lot of fantastic articles, a lot of information there. Let's say I'm someone who's now really interested and I want to I want to get some information. I can I can read a lot of your articles. But what about some of the courses and stuff that you that you have there? Can you tell us about what you what kind of things you offer? Yeah, well, we just introduced just recently a program where people can come in and pay thirty two ninety nine a month and take live courses. Okay? Yeah. So that's one one of the options. And that's been real popular. That's from you. Yeah. Yep. That's from Hackers Arise. I mean, would you be presenting that, or have you got a group of people I, presenting no, it? No, I'd be presenting it. There's, okay. there's a few of there's a few of us here, but I do most of the teaching. So that's thirty two ninety nine for live courses. We have a cybersecurity starter bundle, which is books and uh, intro videos for one hundred and forty nine dollars. We have a subscriber package where for seven hundred and fifty dollars you get all twenty five courses. Are of like intro to intermediate courses over three years. So you can choose to come to live courses. You can come, you can get the videos. You can do either one of those two. You know? So if you really like just watching videos, you can do that. Or you can come to the live courses. And the advantage of the live courses, of course, is that you get to ask questions. You know, yeah, yeah. If you're just watching you know, a video, you don't have the option to say, oh, well, I don't understand that. Whereas in the live courses, you can you can ask me. I'll, I'll tell you. How do, we, how do we do that? And then we have the subscriber pro which is more advanced classes that is $1,500 over three years. These are prices for three years. We try to keep it affordable. I know for some people that even that's going to be a bit much. So it all depends upon your circumstances. But we try to create packages that will fit most people's budget so they can at least get started. You know, $32.99 a month works out to, you know, about a buck a day. If you're not willing to invest a dollar a day into your career, <laughs> then it probably isn't important to you. So we're, you know, we just introduced that just in the last month or so. And I think that's, you know, it's become very popular. I want to encourage people that if you want to, if you're considering making a career in cybersecurity hacking, a dollar a day, I think is reasonable, be able to make that investment and then invest the time. So a yeah. dollar a time day. Time is a problem. Yeah. Time is a problem. Time yeah. is, is sometimes more difficult yeah. than the dollar a day, right? <laughs> a dollar a day and then invest the time to study and come to classes. And your courses are really practical. It's, it's like it's pure like red teaming, proper hacking type stuff. It's not like theoretical things. Is that right? Well, we have both. You yeah. know, there are some well, there are some theoretical courses, but mo we try to keep it practical. Even when we're doing a theoretical course, we try to apply it to real world circumstances. Right. So you know, we try to give a mix, and uh, you know, sometimes you have to have some theory yeah. to be able to be effective because. The world changes. <laughs> so yeah. if I teach you how to do something today, it may not work tomorrow, okay, because yeah. the world changes. But if you have the theory behind it, then you can adapt, okay, and then make that tool, you know, make the changes to the tool, understand the defenses that are now up in place and how I can get around it. And without that theory, you're not, you can't adapt. You, know, you, you can't just go in and say, I'm going to learn a bunch of tools and a bunch of techniques. That's good. That's a good place to start. But you still need to understand the theory so that you can grow beyond that. The theory allows you to develop your own tools, your own techniques. Uh, you're on Twitter as well, is that right? I am. So, and it's what, Occupy the Web or 3Cube, is, is, is that, that's the handle, it's, yeah? It's Occupy the Web at 3Cube. Okay. And um, so people can follow you there because I, I see you post a lot of stuff. Are there any other accounts like people that you'd recommend that um, someone who's want, wanting to get into this follows? Yeah, I I like both uh, Hacks for Pancakes okay, and Dave Kennedy. Both of them are really good. Dave Kennedy has uh, Trusted Sec. He works for Trusted Sec. Yeah. And uh, uh, Hacks for Pancakes is actually, what's her name? Uh, she works for she works for Dragos, the big industrial control system. It's the Leslie what's her name? Leslie Carhart. And she's at Dragos. Um, I also I mean, I think Eva side has a lot of really good insights and she's very funny. <laughs> Eva side is uh, 
uh, head of cybersecurity for um, for the Freedom Foundation. Uh, what's it called? FFS. I think she has a lot of good insights. You know, if you're interested in in general in freedom of information, uh, she is at EFF. I'm sorry, at EFF, the Electronic Freedom Foundation. She's head of cybersecurity there. I recommend her as well. There's there's actually a lot of good people on yeah. Twitter, but those are the three. Good, that pop good place in. to start. Yeah, those are the people that I follow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that I like. Okay, and I think they have have uh, some interesting insights. Any closing thoughts, you know, do you want to give us your manifesto if you like for I, I don't want to use that word but like what you what you believe and why this is important? Well, I've long maintained that hacking is the most important skill set of the 21st century. I put yeah. it into all my books. I I want to emphasize that and I think that Russia now, Putin now just emphasizes why that is so important. And this is 2022. In 2032 it'll be even more important, all right? So right now, it's very important, <laughs> but each year, it gets more and more important. And so that's kind of my manifesto, is hacking is really, really important. It is the ultimate martial art. The true meaning of that word is martial, meaning fighting art. Hacking is just as much a martial art as any of the others, as say, you know, we could go through history and go through all the martial arts, but this is the most contemporary and most advanced of the martial arts. Right now, it is the ultimate martial art, meaning the last, the most important. It may not always be, <laughs> but it is now, yeah. and foreseeable future, it will be. I can close with those thoughts. I really want to thank you, Occupy the Web. Um, thank you so much for, you know, sharing what you believe in, but also giving people like like an imp like a roadmap or some some ideas if they really want to get into this. So really want to appreciate it. Well, I really want to thank you for your time. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, David. Appreciate it. Cheers.